but this is wonderful. Uh, it's great to see uh, that everybody has uh, come on board. So I'm going to go ahead and, and start uh, the introductions. Um, I'm Ron Silver. I think most people know me, but if you don't, uh, I'm a member of the Adult Education Committee. And um, one of our themes over the course of the last 12 months has been to look at the um, Hebrew prophets. And, and first, we, we did a fairly in-depth look with uh, Rabbi Joseph at the, the prophets themselves. Uh, I talked about the, uh, the influence uh, on, on Dr. King of the prophets, and particularly Rabbi uh, uh, Heschel. And then we launched into other um, uh, faiths, and we've had a wonderful conversation about the prophets through the lens of the uh, LDS Mormon Church. Uh, with uh, Steve Allison, and we had a great discussion with uh, Joad Khan from Muslim Education Trust about Islam and the prophets. And with this being uh, Black History Month, we thought it would be great to see how the prophets are reflected through the lens of the Black church. And so the, it was pretty obvious who we were going to reach out to, um, <laughs> our um, our a resident rabbi on the other side of town who masquerades as a Baptist uh, minister, uh, uh, Reverend Dr. J.W. Matt Hennessy. Uh, he is the senior uh, servant, senior pastor at Vancouver Avenue First Baptist Church. And uh, he took over that role in 2005. And one of the things he did uh, very quickly is he, he reestablished a relationship that had been uh, dormant but went back to the days of uh, Rabbi Rose, uh, Emmanuel Rose, and uh, Dr. Obi Williams, who was forever the pastor at uh, Vancouver Avenue. And he has reestablished that relationship with, uh, with uh, our temple, with Rabbi Kahana. Um, we, you know, for the, anybody who has not been to our MLK event, uh, you need to come just to see uh, uh, Pastor Hennessy closes out, my wife's favorite part of the whole service. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Rabbi Kahana goes and he's, he, he and, and he's always uh, speaks at um, uh, Vancouver Avenue. Uh, I sing in the choir occasionally. Uh, and we have had students from Vancouver Avenue come with us, with our students, on our trips to the south to, uh, we, we went together down to Alabama. And so we've had a wonderful relationship. Uh, and I just want to say a couple, just a couple other things of, of personal involvement I've had with, uh, with uh, Pastor Hennessy. Um, he is very involved in uh, working with the Portland Police Bureau to try to make them more responsive to the community. Uh, and um, I had the real privilege to walk with uh, Pastor Hennessy uh, one night for last Thursday on Alberta Street. Where it just it was just really quite impressive to see him walking and just walk up to a group of uh, teenagers and uh, just the whole night we just walked those streets together diffusing um, anxiousness diffusing uh, hostility towards uh, towards the police bureau that was there to just sort of try to maintain order that night so it was, it was really an impressive um, thing to experience uh, and so with that. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Hennessy to take us through the Hebrew prophets through the lens of the Black Church. What I'm going to ask you to do, uh, you, us, our, the congregation, is if you have a question along the way, please put it into the chat. I'm going to be monitoring the chat over the course of uh, Pastor Hennessy's talk. I'll be posing those questions to him at the end. I've got a couple of my own, and uh, then we will have a discussion. But uh, uh, with that, Pastor, I uh, happily turn it over to you to do the hard work. Well, uh, good evening, my friends. It's great to be with you. I am grateful for your uh, invitation. Uh, this is the first time I've received an invitation from Congregation Beth Israel, because as we were talking before we began, what I have usually gotten is an edict from either Ron or my brother, uh, Rabbi Michael Kahana, and it's uh, basically instruction as to what I'm going to do. Uh, and uh, this time around, uh, uh, Brother Ron was halfway there. He told me what I was going to talk about. 
Um, and uh, I, no matter what, I, there's no question that I was going to be here. I love that introduction so well. I had a hard day today, uh, as some of us do from time to time. And I realize that this is recorded, but you know, it was so good. I would just like Michael to say the whole thing all over again, because maybe it's what I need to, as an uplift tonight. I'm just teasing. I'm reminded as I listen to that wonderful introduction of a statement that Dr. King made in 1967, as he was in New York City addressing the uh, radio broadcasters convention. And uh, someone introduced him and he said, uh, when he got up to speak, he said, you know, I love that introduction so much. It reminds me of the story of the maid who went to work one day and her employer said to her, Anne, I understand that you're getting married. She said, no, I'm not getting married, but thank God for the rumor. So I don't know that any of these things that Ron has said about me are true, uh, but I say thank God for the rumor. It's, a, it's wonderful. Um, what I also think is great is that we have the opportunity to really be in relationship with one another. And in the times that we're living in, uh, I have, I've always been a proponent of really reaching out to my brothers and sisters who may not look like me and have different experiences than I do. I grew up in foster care in Columbus, Ohio from the time I was born uh, until I uh, was an emancipated adult as a student at Oberlin College. But I will never forget the importance of moving from my neighborhood to being bused uh, actually to a city called Bexley. It's a suburb of Columbus. And in those days, um, it had a heavily Jewish population. And therefore, I went to school with people who were Jewish, and I had absolutely no clue what that meant. Uh, and it wasn't until much later, before, um, yeah, before I graduated, that I had the blessing of actually going to school in Israel. Um, that was sponsored by the Greater Miami Jewish Federation in Miami, Florida. And 30 of us from the United States spent six months together in Bait Barrel outside of, outside of um, I'm sorry, in Kafar Saba, outside of Tel Aviv. And uh, we learned so much. Five of us were from Ohio, three from Columbus and two from Cleveland. And the rest of the folks were from Miami. And what an amazing experience it was. And what's interesting is that being 16 years old, which as you know, was only yesterday for me, um, I still have connections uh, to the very family that considered themselves and I considered them my foster family in Israel. And we still have relationship today. And I'm really grateful for that. Uh, Ron gave me uh, what, what might seem if you're me, an impossible task. And I think Ron is uh, known to give out nothing but impossible tasks. So I'm going to try to take his impossible task and I'll tell you why I see it as an impossible task. And that is when it comes to the influence of Hebrew prophets on the black church, there are so many ways that one can go. And so I'm going to speak broadly and then narrowly as I come to the core of the information that I'd like to share tonight. First of all, the history of the Black church, remember, is the only place that the slaves could have an opportunity to come together and feel free. So it was a very, very important time. But remember, if I step back a minute, the slaves who came to this country, and remember, we're the one group of, of people who came here not because we wanted to. Uh, we came here because we were forced to. And we were literally brainwashed of everything else of our culture that we would have known, including our spiritual relationship with God. And so when you think about that some 400 and some odd years ago and recognize where we are today, that's a broad amount of history to try to cover and especially 
because of what happened afterwards. So let me go back and just say that the one thing about church from the standpoint of slavery is that it was the one place where the slaves felt that they could have some say after a week of doing nothing but hard work and hard labor, especially if you did not work in the house, but you worked in the field. And when people came together, one of the things that is sort of a true line or through line from there to today is the importance of being able to have a very interactive and very, very spirit-led and song-led uh, kind of service. As a matter of fact, you've got one of the most articulate rabbis uh, in the nation, in uh, Rabbi Michael Kahana. And if you think he preaches well uh, in your sanctuary, your beautiful sanctuary, you need to come with him sometime when he comes here because he preaches so much different and he gets all kinds of amens and people stand up and, you know, every now and then our folks will get happy enough to throw things at him. And I, he just keeps right on preaching. I just want you to know that's just part of our culture. Um, but I want you to know that as we think about the black church, it's not monolithic any more than almost any other uh, religion or any other institution is either. So when you think about it, if you think about us, one person would have a difficult time trying to speak for the entire black church. But I'm going to distill this thinking about first, we have some different denominations. There are Baptists, there are AMEs, which are African Methodist Episcopal. There's African Methodist Episcopal Zion. There's Christian Methodist Episcopal, which in its origin was colored Methodist Episcopal, meaning these are black denominations, predominantly black denominations. Then there are the Pentecostals. There's Church of God in Christ. There's the conservative Baptists. There's the primitive Baptists. And as much as I tease about Rabbi Kahana just a few minutes ago, I preached one time in a primitive Baptist church, and I'd never heard of that denomination, but it was before I preached there. It's outside of Nashville, Tennessee, and I was about 25 years old at the time, and I had never seen people roll on the ground and uh, shout as much as they did, and I remember standing up preaching, and all of a sudden, this uh, person from the back of the church up the middle aisle start running straight to the pulpit. And I'm telling you, it didn't look like they were going to stop. So at one point, I got out of the way so that I would not be in their way. But that was a part of how they expressed their spirituality. There are Black denominations within the dominant culture. They are United Methodists. They are Free Will Baptists. Some are Catholic, some are Episcopalian, Lutheran, non-denominational, and the list goes on. There are a group of black uh, conventions, uh, National Baptist Convention, National Baptist Convention Incorporated, Progressive National Baptist Convention, General Baptist Convention, and the list goes on. There are black uh, gatherings of churches within the dominant culture in the Southern Baptist, Convention, American Baptist Convention, although uh, the American Baptist Convention is probably the one convention where it's 40% white, 40% black, and 20% other. So there is no dominant culture, but again, very, very, um, very multi ethnic, if you will. But our focus tonight to be able to discuss this topic, I've distilled it down to how the Black Baptist Church in the 21st century with COVID-19 responds due to the massive uh, amount of information on this topic. So it'll be from the perspective of the General Baptist Convention here in the Northwest, but it's still about the prophets. What is a prophet? For us, and by the way, I don't um, I don't plan in any way to try to speak to this from the standpoint of getting deep in theology as much as it will be deep in practicality and spirituality 
as we focus on how the impact of profits as we look at them in this COVID-19 environment and what the words of the prophets, how they have influenced our ability to minister and to pastor in this environment. Does that make sense to everybody? I can see a few faces, so I don't expect amens, but a nod will be just fine. Uh, because again, I want to do justice. Amen. <laughs> there you go. I want to do justice to our topic tonight. To us, we look at the prophets as extremely important in our duty as people who are called to really dispense, not just from a standpoint of preaching and teaching, but also living and utilizing the word of God in such a way that it uplifts and helps and inspires and instructs and creates direction for the people of God. So if you're, if you're writing notes, it's really about um, instruction, direction, and inspiration. And I wanna look at a few of the prophets. First of all, let's take Abraham. We see Abraham as a prophet and we look at Abraham and look at the amazing thing that he did. As we look at it in our context, here's a guy 75 some years old, his middle class has some of everything by the way. And then he hears the word of God say, by the way, wonderful job, great thing. Now, by the way, I'm using, I said 21st century language from a black perspective, all right? so. So here we are, he's got all these great things. The guy says, listen, wonderful thing going on there, but guess what? I've got another place for you. And I want you to leave that place. And I want you to go to this other place where I have prepared for you this land of milk and honey. What does that mean from an impact standpoint for us? We don't read anywhere in our context that Abraham argued with God. What we read in our context is that Abraham, or Abram, as his name was initially, uh, we see him be cooperative with God, in partnership with God. And even though it's uncomfortable at that age, and by the way, with all that stuff, to basically say, I'm going to move my family to where God is leading us. I know you have to understand that as a Black preacher, we we tend to add a bunch of conjecture uh, and il you know, illustrate in such a way. I, I can imagine that he could not have taken everything that he had with him on this journey and that he had to give some things up and he had to make some sacrifices and he had to deal, ladies, forgive me, with a wife who said, you heard what? Excuse me, I'm sorry, y'all didn't, didn't hear me. And, and in the Jewish context, that may not happen. But anyway, as far as we, we tell the story, we recognize that this man has gone out and said, you know, much like, uh, you know, Job's wife in our context, uh, Job's wife, Mrs. Job said, why don't you just go on and curse God and die, get this thing over with, right? What we see here is that no matter what was going on in the backstory, the forefront of the spiritual theological message is that there was an adherence and appreciation and an understanding of the importance of hearing the instruction of God and to care as much relationally as he did to leave everything that he knew that was familiar and go into a land that was completely unfamiliar and that uh, all we can do is assume there were plenty of family members that went with him, but he did it because God called him to do it. How does that impact me as a COVID-19 pastor? When COVID-19 hit and we were told that we had to close church, that we had to do all of these other things that all of us have had to do, oddly enough, this was the year that we were going to invest because of our physical plant, we had been putting so much money in our uh, physical plant to take care of maintenance that had been ignored for many years. And I remember coming to your Martin Luther King Shabbat, watching my brother the year that you all 
went to uh, him using the iPad for your, for your service. We hadn't used that yet. So we immediately had to sit and I was praying at our altar saying, Lord, I'm looking for you to help give me direction as to how I'm to handle this unprecedented edict that has come down and knowing that our people are definitely high touch, are definitely people who believe in showing up at the, if you will, the, the temple or the, the sanctuary are very much uh, involved in and less involved, I might add, because at the time, 40% of, I'm sorry, 35 to 40% of our congregation were people who are 60 and above. And how am I going to immediately turn around and say, we're still having church, but somehow we're going to have to figure out other ways for you to have it. What's really neat is as I sat, or rather kneeled at our altar, I heard God say, I'm gonna help you find the way. And in doing so, I thought about Abraham, Abram, who had to leave everything he knew. And for us, it was leaving everything we knew about how to have church, because we didn't know how to have church any other way, except to say that we come to a building and that we hear a preacher, and we hear a choir. And one of the things our folks will tell you is that I love choirs and praise teams. And, um, and Ron has experienced that one time Ron came to our church and he was sitting out in the audience when he came. And at one point I said, knowing he hadn't been in choir rehearsal, I said, you know, you don't belong out there, get up there in the choir stand. And believe me, he didn't give me a hard time. He jumped right in that choir stand. And when you looked at Ron Silver, he was clapping and praising just like everybody else was, right? And what I knew is that we had to be willing. And, and, and what my congregation can tell you is I didn't particularly go for YouTube music at all, but I had to break that one big immediately. We went on to Facebook, we began recording our services, we made sure that our was uh, ready for the kind of services that we were gonna have. We have a prayer line um, for people who are not as high tech and we connected that and give them opportunities to be able to speak into the service or speak into Sunday school or speak in to Bible study. The, the power of Abraham's example was a power that was utilized in COVID-19 to say nothing is the same as it was before. And yet it's important to do this. There's a passage in my context that tells us that we are to do what God sends us to do without talking back and without grumbling. Lord, 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 let, let me just say that one more time. I know that doesn't happen in Judaism, that you hear the rabbi say something, and you might have something to say under your breath. Uh, but in the Baptist uh, context, it, it wouldn't necessarily be amen at that point. They wonder, has the old man lost his marbles? So anyway, that doesn't happen in your context, you understand. I look at Moses really quickly, as again, as again we're in the area of, of direction and instruction. And that's, that look at Moses, there he is, 40 years in Pharaoh's house, 40 years in the wilderness. And as he starts, what he doesn't know, but his second 40 years, third 40 years, God comes to him in this, in our context, as we read it, a burning bush. And in that burning bush, as he sees from afar off, but hears a voice calling him, to the burning bush and for him to take his shoes off because he's standing on holy ground and the understanding of how God will come to you in the most amazing ways and give you an instruction that you may sound may sound as shocking when he says, I want you to go down to Egypt. Just take a stroll down to Egypt, and I just want you to do me a big favor and go talk to that mean old guy, Pharaoh, and tell him to let your people go, let my people go. Um, as we look at that, again, as I draw inspiration from that, um, we are cousins of Moses, and I know this doesn't happen in the Jewish context, 
But the first thing we see is Moses talking back to the Lord saying, you must have the wrong dude because there's no way in the world that I'm the one that's going to go down there and be paid attention to by the Pharaoh because I, I you know, I, I speak with a lisp and, and there's no way that I can go because of here's all my deficiencies. But, you know, uh, Raphael or, or, or Shlomo, he can go because he's got you know, more, that's the guy you really need. And of course, God made it clear, no, it's not going to be somebody else. It's going to be you. And one of the things that we talk about in the Black church, what has sustained the Black church are people who have made decisions that we're going to stay here and work our way through it, if you think about it, from slavery to Reconstruction to Jim Crow to the Civil Rights Movement and, and, and beyond, you've had the black church as the center of social change, the center of the community, that when people gathered, it was at the church. When the civil rights movement meetings were held, they were held at the church. And as we look at this, and by the way, I'm, uh, many of you may know that I'm the godchild of Coretta Scott King. I still hear her telling me how Dr. King came home that night in Montgomery, when he at 26 years old, who was the youngest of the pastors in Montgomery who had gathered and had been there the least amount of time was the one that they asked to be president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. And Dr. King came home saying, there is no way that I can do this. He was Moses uh, after his time saying, there's no way I can do this. There's this, there's Fred Shuttlesworth. There's all these different people. And the fact is God didn't call any of them. He called Dr. King. And in this text, God didn't call anybody else. He called Moses. And it was for Moses to do. And I love God's message back after listening to Moses grumble to remind him I'm the one that made your tongue. I'm the one that's giving you instruction. I'm the one that will feed your mouth with the words that need to be. And in COVID-19, the same has been true. There have been many pastors who have wondered, am I the one to take us through? Or is this a moment where God is saying somebody else will be the one to take us through? There have been churches that have closed. There have been people who have resigned. There have been a number of people who have really suffered uh, serious mental health issues and all of that because from their perspective, this was more than they could handle. And those of us who've remained, again, gain inspiration from the example of Moses reminding us that a power higher than us is the one who's called us and the one who has helped make the way. And as I mentioned at the end of my uh, comments this past Martin Luther King Shabbat, that I think about the example of Moses on the one hand, feeling very much less than to do this, but never argued with God about that anymore. He had other arguments with God, but not about that, not about speaking. And what we see is the power of God working through every one of us. And there have been times in my time during this COVID-19 experience where I have felt like I'm not sure I can do this, but at the same time, I hear God's voice saying, I'm the one that called you and I will make the way for you. And there have been moments during this period where I have seen miracle after miracle after miracle that God has really seen us through. So what seemed impossible and as they stood at the Red Sea, what seemed impassable. I've seen God, as I'm sure you have seen in your own personal lives, do things that have been absolutely amazing. I go to Isaiah, who has been another source of strength. Even when we look at Isaiah in our, um, in our context, it's uh, chapter six in Isaiah, where King Isaiah has died and God is calling Isaiah at that moment. And Isaiah's statement is, feeling like I'm a man with unclean lips, speaking to people with unclean lips. And yet he is part of our inspiration because what he said was so profound and so important 
as we think about COVID-19 and the demands that are on us and the demands for how we show up in the world is a reminder that what Isaiah did is not grumble. What Isaiah did is say, Lord, if you need somebody, send me, I'll go. And in that wonderful statement that he makes, knowing that he may have some of the same doubts that Moses expressed out loud, his response was, I will do it. I will work. And what, if the one thing we all need in COVID-19 is to understand that in Oregon in particular, Portland, more specifically, they ain't but 10 Black people here in the first place. Now, by the way, I say that pejoratively. There aren't that many of us here. 1.6% of the population in this 4.2 million person state are Black or African American, of which 60,000 or 70,000 are right here in the metro area. So we have very few people to look to, to come to church. Number one, we've got many that have gone into denominational churches. We've got many who got tired of church when they grew up because it's not as culturally connected as Judaism is, if you will. We've got people who have achieved a certain amount of prominence and have more than two nickels to rub together that they're not sure that their success has had a darn thing to do with the power of God in their life. And so we deal with that issue. And so we look around and say, okay, we can't have anybody here who has immune issues. We can't have anybody here who is 65 years or older because of the power of this very deadly disease. We can't have anybody here who has the potential for any number of immune issues, regardless of age, that they could potentially pass something to somebody else. Well, when you start eliminating how many people can actually be here or how many people are caring for people at their home or how many children, excuse me, um, or parents, I'm sorry, who are taking care of you know, mom or grandma or somebody like that, you begin to realize there's very few people to get the work done. And yet we are inspired by the words of Isaiah, which says, Lord, if you need somebody, send me, I'll go. We need workers. And the black church is dealing with the issue of workers in the first place, but even more so in COVID-19. And then a number of people, and while we've had a number of people join church, during this period, we've also had some people that we've definitely depended on, and they chose that during this period, I think it's time for us to go elsewhere and not be here because on the one hand, some are listening to many conspiracy videos. Others are extremely tied to a number of things that say that this virus isn't real and that we are doing too much in the way of demanding that people use uh, face coverings and that we have people walk through a, um, a machine that looks much like walking through the uh, security at the airport. Um, and they, they just don't believe in that and don't want to do that. And that's a multiplicity of people, black and white um, and all of that. So, I mean, really that. The other thing is, is we don't have membership dues. We rely on people loving God enough that they want to be able to give, but be sure that sometimes if people aren't able to go to church, they also aren't able to pay. While we provide lots of different ways for people to give to the church, during COVID-19, we've seen a number of people not give because they're also not coming to church. I'm not making judgment. I'm just speaking fact. But again, we need that. So the other inspiring area of Isaiah, there are many, but I'm just going to speak to uh, two more. One is the importance of, uh, again, in our context, Isaiah 40, 31, wait on the Lord. Uh, they that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. That has been, again, when I talk about, I talked about instruction and, uh, and direction 
Inspiration is the last piece. And it's a reminder that because Ron's gonna tell me I have to hush in just a moment, but uh, it's a reminder of the fact that we need that inspiration that while we can't see what the end's going to be, we recognize that where we are is not tenable for the long run, that we've literally had to do such things as have service out in the parking lot. For us on the first Sunday, giving communion or the Lord's Supper is important, but people can't come into the church. Those who are in the church are fine, and we follow OHA's instructions at Oregon Health Authority, but we also make the opportunity for people to meet in the parking lot to get their communion because we know that this is important to them, and therefore we've got to be creative about what we do. We have had Bible study outside in the parking lot as well, and doing anything that we can using the power uh, and inspiration, if you will, of those that came before us. Uh, Isaiah 43 is another inspiring moment where we see the assurances of God that no matter what you're going through, he says, when you come to the water, you're not going to drown. When you come to the fire, you're not going to burn. Why? Because I am the Lord, your God. I'm the Holy One of Israel. And I am paying attention to you. I am protecting you. I am working with you. I will not leave you. What did he say to Joshua? I, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And as we think about it, uh, Joshua's example is one of the most amazing examples to us through um, the prophets as we think about the power of the beginning of his ministry where he's looking for his blanket. You know, I, I often talk about this part of it is mu much like those of you I'm looking at those I can see. You, you all don't know anything about Charlie Brown. You all were too young for that. Um, but Charlie Brown had a friend named Linus. Is he the one with the blanket that even when he played the piano, he had to have it? Well, Joshua was looking for his blanket. And God let him know that Moses is dead. He's gone. That's all there is to it. This is you. But he said to him, do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid because I am with you and I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And right there in our context in the first chapter, he gives that security blanket to let him know as daunting as this may seem, it's gonna be all right because I'm going to be by your side. And if you look at that in contrast, in the first chapter, you see a very concerned Joshua. In the 24th chapter, you see a very confident Joshua who gathers all of the children together and reminds them, if you want to serve the gods on the other side of the flood, you can do that. If you And he talks about the, the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and all those folks. He says, but I want you to know that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And in a day and a time where people get upset with you because, and, and people get upset with me, this again doesn't happen in your context necessarily, but in mine, I'm not preaching the world's going to end tomorrow. I'm, I'm not pre because I, because my context is I don't know when the world's going to end. And so therefore I'm not going to stand in the pulpit and talk some trash about, guess what? You better do this, that, or the other, because the world's going to end tomorrow. By the way, some of our, um, our, our, um, our, our um, pastors and preachers and teachers, when I was growing up, would even preach such things from the pulpit that the only people that were going to heaven were Baptists, or the only people going to heaven were this, that, and the other. And I'm saying, you know what? I questioned all that, but I never said anything out loud because I wasn't crazy. Because I knew when I grew up that if you challenged a person older than you, that you might find your head in the middle of the following week. So those are things that you don't do. But when I became uh, a seminary student and really began to really dig deep in the word, I found a number of things that I had been taught. And, the, and again, I don't judge them. They were teaching us what they knew. But it's important for me to teach what I know and to know that we serve an amazing and almighty God who I believe has far greater understanding uh, and far greater knowledge. Again, Isaiah says, 
uh, my knowledge is greater than yours. My, uh, my understanding is greater than yours as well. And so we have that opportunity to recognize that, no, I'm not going to get up there and try to say that. No, I don't use my religious back. I'm sorry, my political background at the pulpit either. Uh, I'm a registered independent and I've tried to teach that no matter who the president is, we've got to support the office of the presidency. I may not particularly appreciate the policies of a number of those who have been in this position, but I'm going to pray for those folks. And I continue to believe that it's important to do that. Along the lines of inspiration, I've just got two more, um, Ron, and then I'm going to, I'll hush. You know, we Baptists have at least three closes. I know you got three closes. That's what you know. You also got about uh, 10, 15 more minutes if you want it. Uh, you're, you're on a roll, Pastor. You're on a roll. Bless you. I see, I, I see a bunch of people sleeping right now, so I'm glad that you have put them on mute. Um, but, uh, but no, um, one of the other ones is uh, Jeremiah. When we think about inspiration, this is the weeping prophet who not only is the judgment of God going to come through him as we think about the fact that, again, the role of the prophet is to tell the people this is what's going on. This is what you must do. You must turn from your, um, from your evil ways. Or I think about um, the story of Jonah uh, and how he tried to run from God. Not always, because when I was in Sunday school as a kid, I always had the impression he ran because he felt like Moses. Well, the reality was that may have been a part of it, but the biggest one is he didn't want God to waste his talent on these Ninevites who weren't going to who weren't going to follow him anyway. And if you, if you, if you remember the context, it, it cracks me up because what Jonah did is end up uh, seeing all these miracles of God and then ended up going and doing what God told him to do. Because again, he's one of our cousins. And then at the end, he's upset because God used his talent that way. And knowing that even though the Ninevites said, we will follow you, that book ends in our context with him still upset. I said he's a modern day, excuse me, black person. That's what I, I tell our congregation is that you're just never satisfied. Um, anyway, the point being made here, so I digress for just a second, is that Jeremiah, <laughs> Jeremiah and, and his inspiration in, 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 in our context is in chapter 29, 11, reminding us that even though there is this very, very difficult doom on its way. God's assurance that I have plans for you and that as we deal in COVID-19 in the 21st century in this particular region of the country to remind us that God has plans for us, plans to help us, plans for our good, plans not to harm us and plans for our future. And that as you think about the disparities in the black community and, and, and brown community, what COVID-19 has shown, what George Floyd's uh, example has shown is that there are so many disparities in this country and certainly in this region where we realize that if we didn't have a relationship with God, I don't think that my brothers and sisters or my ancestors could have ever survived. But because they had a belief in the power of God to change their circumstances, that that in and of itself was the push for them to be able to survive and to give us the opportunity to continue. And that's very much, uh, if I pause for a minute, one of the reasons why I have so much uh, joy and respect for the Jewish um, uh, religion and community because I've been to Yad Vashem. Now, I got to tell you, I didn't know Yad Vashem at 17 years old. I did not know about the Holocaust because it was not taught in our high school or it was not taught or was a, a brief mention. But I got a chance to go there. I got a chance to go to Dachau. I've had a chance to go in Munich. I've had a chance to go outside of Vienna, Austria to another concentration camp and to see that 6 million people lost their lives and yet the Jewish family continues. That is the inspiration that we get and remember 
that one of the words or some of the words of our brother um, Isaiah or rather Jeremiah is that I have plans for you. No matter how bleak, how difficult and all of this, you're going to make it anyway. And I have. So I've seen Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, both the old uh, Yad Vashem and the new. Because my last time there was in 2015. But I've also been to Washington, D.C. Uh, to see the Holocaust Memorial there um, as well. And um, it reminds me again of the importance of inspiration. And so I say that as this coming Sunday, we're going to do in our context, we're going to have for black history, a celebration of music from hymns to spirituals to gospels and really speaking to the heritage of them and what they have meant to our culture and how they have kept us going. My uh, Israeli mother, Dorothy Forster, who God rest her soul is uh, gone now. But I used to sing to her. We After dinner uh, in Israel, they lived in Lod. I would sing to her while we did dishes in the kitchen after dinner. And she used to say to me when she would write letters, we'd write them back and forth. They were the aerograms that we would send. I think they're called um, we would send them back and forth to one another. And she would always say, if you were around more often, and if you would sing to me in the kitchen, she said, I would do dishes more often. I've now given that task to somebody else. <laughs> but the point is, songs have been big for us. They've been our inspiration. I remember in my second foster family, which was not the easiest family to live in at all. I lived with some horrors of humanity and unfortunately was scarred by them um, as I came from that experience, but I could still hear my foster mother cooking in the kitchen and humming gospels or uh, hymns and things like that. Um, those are our inspirations. And when I would get in trouble for not having done anything, I learned at an early age how to sing those very songs. And so when Mother Dorothy would say that I would do dishes more often if you were here singing to me, it was because I was bringing to her part of my culture and what helped me be able to stand flat foot in situations in my own home that I really could not deal with almost any other way. Finally, I think about the unique role that Habakkuk plays, that in our context as we read Habakkuk, what we see is that where usually it's God speaking to the prophet and the prophet speaking to the people, it's the, it's the people speaking to the prophet, the prophet speaking to God. And the basic message is, hey, how is it that those folks that are, you know, not really, you know, doing your thing the way you want it done, how do they seem to be prospering and doing much better than the rest of us who are really trying to do things the way you want it done. And by the way, um, Habakkuk takes a handshake to every century that we've lived in because there's always been people who are saying, you know what, dang, I'm really trying to live for God, but it seems to me that those who don't seem to do a heck of a lot better than we do. And the transformation in that book from what Habakkuk sees in the beginning to what he's able to see at the end is the final statement of, of, uh, of inspiration that I give you tonight. In the third chapter, he reminds us that, you know what, I've learned that the, um, that the, the, the field that I have planted and the yield that I am seeking may not always be everything that I want it to be. I may not get back what I have planted. I may not get back a dividend on the investment that I have made. But he gets to the 17th verse in the third chapter. He says, but yet I have come to know how to depend on God, whether it's good or it's not good. My devotion is such that even if I get back what I don't wish to get, 
I am going to serve and pay attention to the power of God who has remained with us in all ways. And the fact that this is very important as it relates to who we are as a people, how we have been able to go forth is to recognize that the power, the inspiration, the direction, the instruction of these wonderful prophets. And by the way, there's plenty more that I could say, but I promised you that I would use the words of these prophets, the importance of their example to help you understand how we in this region, this Black Baptist Church context have utilized the examples of those amazing prophets who came before us and the challenges that they faced to help us and certainly personally to help me deal with a challenge that we could never have assumed would happen. And I still hear the voice the first time we had a business meeting. So we've tried to do everything we can to keep everything as normal as possible. We have four church meetings, eight business meetings a year. We still do. We do them on the uh, conference line. Uh, we have Bible study every Wednesday night from six to seven. We still do on the conference line. We still have uh, meetings of various ministries. We still do on the conference line. We still have church every Sunday. We've got an eight o'clock service and a 1045 service. We still do from the time this pandemic began until now. And that leads me to my final statement. And that is, I still hear Mother Odom, who was not, by the way, did not vote for me to be pastor of this church. And for several years, Mother would roll her eyes and all that stuff when she would see me come in. And, you know, I'm so glad that God called me when he did, because at an earlier time in my life, I might not have dealt with that in the same way. But every time she'd roll her eyes, I'd come up and give her the biggest hug. I decided, you know what, I'm going to love this woman. I'm just going to love her. That's all there is to it. And about three years ago, mother at the end of a Bible study said, my birthday's coming up, pastor, and I want you. It's my that I can't remember what milestone birthday was. I think it, I thought it was her 90th. She said, I want you to know that I'm going to lunch that day and I'm inviting you to come with. And I must have not had my game face on that day because I was so startled by what she said that she said back to me, she said to everybody, look at pastor. He looks really shaken by what I just said. She said, but I want pastor to know that I love him. I'm like, Lord, have, what is going on? She said, I love him. She said, I love you, and I want you to know that I love you. Marry that statement, if you will, to our first business meeting when the, after the pandemic hit, which was, I'm sorry, the second one, because it was in July. Mother got on the phone just as tickled as she could be because she's been inside this whole time. But she said to everybody, I just want you all to know that if this pandemic had to hit, I am glad that it hit in pastor's 15th year because I don't know how we would have made our way through this pandemic without him at, as our leader. I, I have to tell you, there is nothing but the power of God that brought forth that transformation. And that tells me that again, as we have looked through some of these uh, topical uh, prophets and the challenges that they had, that it brings to me uh, instruction, direction, and inspiration to keep on doing the work that is before us, to roll up our sleeves and say, Lord, if you need somebody, send me, I'll go. Thank you very much. <laughs> so y'all, everybody else gets to hear me clap. <laughs> so, Pastor, that was, thank you for this wonderful wonderful discussion. I have a, a couple of comments I want to make uh, and then um, and then I'm going to go into the questions. Um, you know what one of the things and this is a, a comment I make to everybody who's listening. you know when we take our students down south, 
<clears throat> it's either been to Alabama or and last time we went to Mississippi. Uh, the, the kids, we take the kids to a, a Baptist church. We go, we go to uh, First Baptist in Montgomery with uh, Baxter Morris as pastor. Or, or this last time we were in Greenwood and we went to um, uh, New Zion Missionary Baptist Church. And I say to the students, you know, if you're going to understand the civil rights movement, you better get your butt in a church on a Sunday morning because that's where the power comes from. And it, it never fails. The students get it uh, to be in that church on a Sunday morning to understand that where the power was that, that drove that uh, drove that movement. Yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, another thing I wanted to say, uh, Pastor, you talked about singing and everything, and I this is just personal. Uh, I'm going to take personal privilege here. Uh, my all-time favorite poem. Uh, you, I don't know if you 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 know where I'm going here, but my all-time favorite poem is by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and it's when Melindy sings. Oh yeah. I'm telling you, if you want to understand anything about music, yep. Go find that poem when Melindy sings. I like that. Paul yep. Lawrence Dunbar. Go yeah. away, quit that noise, Miss Lucy. Put that <laughs> music book away. What do you do? <laughs> keep on trying? If you practice till you're gray, you can't start no notes of flying like the ones that rants and rings from the kitchen to the big woods when Melindy sings. And that's just the start of it. No, that's right. That's a great poem. It really yeah. is. And I couldn't even recite it that well. Yeah, well, thank you. That's really. Uh, and the other thing I just want to say to our to our our, our, our Jewish congregation that, that's with us here tonight, uh, I have spent a lot of time in black churches. I've been to a lot of black Baptist churches, AME churches, and I just want to uh, I want to I want to make, give you an invitation. One of the reasons why I have done that and been so comfortable with that is uh, never once. Have I, and, and every time I've been in a black church, any, everybody knows I'm Jewish. Never once has anyone tried to convert me. Amen. They're just happy that I'm there. Yeah. So go hang out some Sunday at, at Vancouver Avenue once we can, uh, or go to Mount Olivet, or, or you know, um, it, it's, 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 it's an experience worth having. Uh, and be not afraid. Uh, yeah, let me let me give two commercials real quick. Um, you can still go to our website, and there are a number of sermons that are on the website, not just mine, but others as well. That's uh, V as in Victor, A as in Adam, F as in Frank, B as in boy, C as in church, um, at, I'm sorry, is that right? Let me make sure I got that right. I think that's right. Dot org. I think it's V-A-F-B-C dot org for Vancouver Avenue First Baptist Church uh, dot org. So you can certainly go there and you'll hear it. If you have simple radio as an app on your phone, you get, it's free. You can go get it if you don't have it. Every Sunday morning at 1030, um, they, they play the recording of our first service. So it'll be music and all uh, for an hour. And I can tell you that because some friends in Philomath sent me a note and said their 11 year old son that they've adopted, that happens to be a white couple. They've been to our church many times, but the young man that they adopted is African-American and uh, he's about 11 years old now. And uh, a few Sundays ago, they sent me a note and said, oh, I just want you to know little Deacon is walking around the house saying, God has a plan. I mean, God has a plan. And I'm like, what? How in the world would they know that this has happened? So they introduced me to the fact that they go, they downloaded um, Simple Radio and then went to 1480 on the AM dial. And there we are. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Ron. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the story. And by the way, the other thing I would say, James Weldon Johnson, uh, many people have heard of the Black National Anthem. And it's not the easiest song to sing. And most people just sing the first verse, but the verse I love is the third verse, which is God of our weary years, God of the silent tears, God who has brought us thus far on our way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, uh, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand 
true to our God, true to our native land. And that started out as a poem by James Weldon Johnson that was turned to music by his cousin, John Rosamon Johnson, and has become the national, the black national anthem. It is a wonderful song. It, it, it's tough to sing. Uh, Daryl Dixon and I jokingly refer to the second verse as the dismal verse. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I said, well, Daryl and I, are we doing the dismal verse today? Stony the road we the first and the third are great. They, they really are. And by the way, this last Sunday, not this past Sunday, because it was snowy and we closed. But the Sunday before that, I actually didn't have somebody who could play it for me. So I had to lead it uh, without, without help. Um, I like to sing, so it was okay. That's good. So there's some questions that have come up. And um, I would, I'm going to ask them, then I've got one at the end. Uh, one of the first ones, in really interesting um, context, you know, I have to tell everybody, last night, uh, Pastor Henderson and I were texting each other as we were both watching the Henry yeah. Louis Gates Black Church uh, program on OPB, which is just terrific. It is. Um, and it talked in there a lot about the Great Awakening, which is when white Christian slave owners first are given permission to bring the word of, of God to their slaves and not suffer the penalty of having to free them. So they're, they're willing to do it. Uh, but one of the, in, we had an interesting question, which is there were, you know, in the South, there were Jewish slave owners. And Rabbi, I'm gonna let you jump in on this as well because you did the talk at that show at Portland Center Stage. In, in, in Jewish families that owned slaves, do we know historically did, was there the similar effort to uh, either get their slaves to become Jewish or, or the question that specifically we had was uh, in for, uh, forcing Jewish rituals on, um, on, on, Jew, on slaves? Uh, can you opine on that? Either one of you, both of you? I, 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 yeah, I wouldn't. I, I don't have a lot of expertise uh, on that, but I've, you know, just from the things that I've, that I've read. What was the name of that play? Which was, it was really something. It was like Whipping Post or Whipping, oh, Whipping Boy. Boy. Whipping Boy. Whipping Boy. Yeah. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, production that uh, Portland Center Stage put on about a um, a Southern family um, who was. Uh, Basically separated during during the war, uh, and the slaves who who stayed behind, and how they had really adapted the culture. This was all around Passover, and how they had really taken on this idea of Passover and how important it was. But uh, I mean, that, that was it was a fascinating story, and I don't know how how centered it was in in history. But of course, Judaism was never evangelical. And the, the, the story, of course, I mean, Pastor, you please tell the story of, of how it was that, uh, that the church, th that the slaves were allowed to, um, to become, what that controversy was, why, why was it not, and, and uh, how those brought about. And the, Judaism was never caught up in that conversation. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, Rabbi and I learned a lesson when we were with the imam last week. He said, uh, I stay in my lane, you stay in your lane. So I want you to know that I don't have a lot of context to give you in that lane. Um, but what I will say is remember that one of the things that the white slave owners were concerned about is the ability for their black slaves to gain education and to... Um, while many of them, I think, made the, uh, as I look at history, made the concession about church in part, uh, rabbis answered part of it. The other part, in my opinion, was that if it'll make them happy and it won't make them want to go to school to get an education, all these other things, um, this is a sacrifice that we can make because the goal is to keep them in slavery um, and anything that would enhance their understanding would be something that would potentially uh, cause them to revolt. And there's a statement Dr. King makes often when he says, uh, said rather, um, that, you know, a Pharaoh, as it related to his slaves, knew how to keep the slaves in slavery, keep them fighting among each other. And as long as they would fight among each other, uh, they remained in slavery. 
Uh, but when the slaves get together, uh, that was the beginning of getting out of slavery. And the, and the message was that if we get together and work together, we can get out of anything that would look like we're slaven to. That is not just about slavery as we know it. That's even modern day 21st century. How do we work together? So remember on many of those plantations, there was still a division among the slaves, those who worked in the house and those who worked in the field. And I think many of you know, there were rather colloquial statements that were made about who they were uh, those in the house versus those in the field as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really neat kind of study to look at. Uh, but I've, I don't know of any, um, any historical record of, of uh, Jewish families uh, trying to proselytize uh, the slaves, as far as I know. Okay. The, the, the interesting, uh, I had read that there was uh, tension because some people, the, the, the uh, uh, emancipationists wanted to uh, have slaves convert to Christianity because that would mean that slave owners would not be able to keep them as slaves. So you can't, you can't enslave a fellow Christian. And the, the, it, it got turned around exactly the opposite, said, no, this is going to teach them how to be good slaves. Yeah, no, because they would use the words of the New Testament which speak to, there are some, but again, the, the definition in the Greek for slaves was not, and, and being enslaved, and we've got a wonderful passage there about Philemon, uh, who was again a preacher in the early church, a reminder that his runaway slave Onesimus had gotten in trouble, and he was a slave, but he now had to be uh, taken back in uh, because he had paid his penalty in prison with the apostle Paul. But when that happened, uh, the Apostle Paul is saying to him, I know you saw him as your slave, but I want you to know now that he is your brother. But that was not always how the slave owner wanted that to be interpreted. The slave owner wanted it to be interpreted that it was God's decision that you shall be enslaved. And as a result of being enslaved, you shall remain enslaved because you are a slave. And that's, again, not, not the way it was, not the way it was uh, to be interpreted. So I, I wanna um, run something by you and, and, and see what you think, Pastor. And I, I'm, I'm describing something from the, the, the great book, Part of the Waters by Taylor Branch, his mm -hmm. book about King. But yeah. he also spends a lot of time there talking about Dr. Vernon Johns. Yes. And this is a, a Vernon Johns story. Um, he, he's describing a meeting of the Southern Baptists and the National Baptists yeah. in Baltimore. And uh, everybody's trying to be nice to each other. The Southern Baptists, of course, being white and the National Baptists being black. Yeah. And he, he describes how um, uh, the, the National Baptists had picked, God knows why, but they picked Dr. Johns to be their, their spokesperson. <laughs> and the, uh, the Southern Baptist gets up and uh, as the way he describes it, he says, the chosen white preacher developed a sermon on the theme of Christian salvation by being washed in the blood of the lamb. Uh, and then uh, as the way uh, Taylor Branch describes it, when the white man finished, John stood up abruptly, didn't wait to be introduced. And he just says, the thing that disappoints me about the Southern white church is that it spends all of its time dealing with Jesus after the cross instead of dealing with Jesus before the cross. He goes on, he says, you didn't do a thing but preach about the death of Jesus. If that were the heart of Christianity, all God had to do was drop down, drop him down on Friday, let them kill him, and then yank him up again on Easter Sunday. That's all you hear. You don't hear so much about his three years of teaching that man's religion is revealed in the love of his fellow man. And, and needless to say, that didn't go over well. But... <laughs> Uh, the thing that I'm struck by is I, as I'm reading John's and he's talking about Jesus those three years before. Yeah. He's really talking, I think, about Jesus channeling the prophets. That's right. Channeling this notion of righteousness and, and love and mercy and truth, uh, which 
you know, you don't hear a lot about sometimes in the white church. And, and so, so that's my theory. And I'm just curious about your response. Well, no, I think your theory is absolutely right. And what he, um, you know, his teachings were about really taking the Mosaic law to its furthest extent and saying, that's good stuff. But if somebody asks you to go with them one mile, go with them two. Uh, the whole, we've got a passage, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five, six, and seven in the Gospel of Matthew. And it really begins to speak to exactly that. And what's really neat is that if you look at the words of Jesus, he quotes the prophets a lot, as a matter of fact. He really does as the foundation for the teaching that he has and the way that he wants us to live. And then you've got the Apostle Paul who comes after that, who was not a believer at all, but has a conversion. And the Apostle Paul then spends the rest of what we know as the New Testament really speaking to the teachings of Jesus. So long after he's gone, the Apostle Paul is teaching about things and he says, I wasn't, this wasn't where I was, but I have come to know and understand. And so, yeah, I, your theory, I think, is right on. And, um, and, and as I tease a couple of friends, I don't know that Rabbi and I have teased, you know, uh, Jesus belongs to you all first. <laughs> and then we adopted him. There you go. Yeah, there you go. But yes, so, it's real. Uh, the last question I'm going to, uh, it, it, I have to ask this because it comes from my chairman, uh, Bill June. Yeah, he, he, uh, he asks, uh, does your church look to other prophets not found in the Hebrew Bible? That's a good question, because actually we look to the Bible from our perspective as solely the word practices and the issues that God wants us to pay attention to. There is, in the Catholic tradition, the apocryphal books. These were books that were written after the close of Malachi and the beginning of the, um, of the gospel age. Uh, there are many of them. They were seen by the early fathers as not God-inspired, and so therefore they are not folded in the, for many of the Protestant uh, religions. I happen to teach a few of these things because, um, you know, our folks, when I first got here, I teased them and said, if I say the word apocrypha, you might think that I'm cussing at you because that's what it sounds like. And the fact of it is, no, that's not what it is, but it's a body of work that is, from, in our context, considered extra biblical, meaning that it is not written for our salvation, but it's written for our understanding. There are ways and places in these various books, and there are several of them, that there is continuity, but it is not what we consider part of what's called the canon, meaning that these were the sacred books that were held for us to be used as our instruction, our direction, and our inspiration. Yeah, so, so we don't t tend to do that, but so when I use it, I don't use it as if I were ever to quote from the book of Susanna or the book of uh, Esdras or the book of, of, of Ecclesiasticus, I may use that as an example, but it's not authoritative. So in other words, I would not lead with it, but I might say something about it and weave the context of what that is, almost like the way we might take any modern or you know, ancient uh, writings and use them in the same way. But in many, so as I talk to you about the different uh, Baptist or black denominations, there are some who wouldn't have this conversation at all and who would see me as heretical for even mentioning it. Um, and at the same time, um, as I've talked with some of my Jewish brothers and sisters, there are some in the Protestant faith or, uh, uh, who also would not spend times around Muslims or Jews because of the way that they have been programmed. I'm just grateful that that has never been my issue. I've got other problems, but that's never been my issue. You know, I, I want to note for our, uh, for our uh, uh, viewers, um, there is a recent book uh, called the Jewish Apocrypha, 
which uh, is a, it's a scholarly book. It's, a, it's, it's dense, but really fascinating. That takes uh, uh, not all of the apocryphal texts, but the ones that really have a Jewish context that help us understand the, the Hebrew Bible uh, from a different perspective. And it's, there, it's really fascinating. Not anything I studied in seminary. Uh, and the apocryphal books were not, as Pastor says, were they were not preserved by the by the authorities, right? Uh, the either the Jewish or the Christian authorities, but they managed to to survive, uh, and then were incorporated in some Christian texts. The Book of Maccabees is the most famous of those, right? Which is not in the Hebrew Bible at all, but is the complete source of our understanding of Hanukkah, right? Uh, but and these, these are really fascinating. And I think, you know, that that view of pro pro prophetic text and of other uh, biblical texts really fascinating in the context of the Apocrypha. Yeah, that I mean, we've got a book, uh, the last book of the new, what we call the New Testament, if you will, is the book of Revelation. I'm sorry, the book of Jude. So uh, one of the brothers of Jesus uh, is said to have written the book of Jude. So actually, it's a one chapter, 26 verses, and in it, he actually, it's the only one of the few places in the Bible that in that part of the New Testament, he, uh, the, some in the book of Paul and all the book of uh, Acts and all of that, they actually use a quotation from the Apocrypha, what we know as the Apocryphal books. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it's interesting how um, it was used again as a piece of literature. And in this case, it was talking about a fight that broke out that Satan was a part of. Um, so it's very interesting. And, I, and what I love is I'm a literalist, a literist anyway, because I really love literature. So I really love the opportunity and, and history. So I really love the opportunity to sort of dissect some of this, not just exegete the text um, and not you know, be too big on eisegeting it as well but to be able to really say, here are some parallels as we think about what this text actually means. And for me, it was a big surprise. And yet I could find other places where that was used as well, but not authoritative, but part of storytelling. This is fascinating. Um, uh, one last story for me, and then I'm going to turn it over to the rabbi. You haven't let other people talk yet, Ron? We... No, no, no. <laughs> But you, know, you you talked about you know uh, there are so many components of the black church, uh, yeah. and I think it was like in the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century when um, uh, Bishop Mason broke the Church of God in Christ off oh, yeah. from the Baptist Church. Oh yeah, uh, you know Church of God in Christ, C O G I C. Well, you know, I've been singing and I've been singing a gospel Christmas for forever, and oh, they've yeah. always had a problem with how they were going to. Uh, note the different organizations in the program. And so I finally convinced them to go, that it was okay to go ahead and put Temple Beth Israel in there. Well, <laughs> a lot of um, Church of God in Christ churches are actually called temples. Yes. And so when whoever was setting the copy <laughs> uh, Temple Beth Israel, the program from the Oregon Symphony said, Temple Beth Israel, C-O-G-I-C. Church of God in Christ, yeah, Koji. I freaked out. <laughs> but then my friend Daryl convinced me, Ron, nobody from the temple knows what C-O-G-I-C means. <laughs> He's fine. And I didn't get drummed out of the congregation, so yeah. it worked out well. Yeah. But uh, then I've always talked, I've been an honorary member of the Church of God in Christ. Oh, no, that's right. Listen, you're an honorary member of our church. Rabbi is on the ministerial staff here. You know, the whole bit, just as I know, somehow my name is somewhere in the annals of history uh, at Congregation Beth Israel, somewhere. Yeah. No, I think uh, what's interesting is I've said to people many times, whether you're co what we call Kojic, Church of God in Christ, uh, or Methodist or any of the others, you were Baptist at one point in, in your life. And... Uh, and the the meth the uh, the Church of God in Christ for those who don't know that that group just really wanted more freedom of expression on the one hand and a belief in the power of the Holy Spirit to have people speak in tongues and things of that nature and that you were not really quote saved unless you did speak in tongues 
which is again, historically has been chronicled um, in Acts chapter two of what happened uh, on the day of Pentecost. But that's one of the big differences is how they worship um, differently than we do in an expression that's far different than, than the way we do it. And, and just for historical context for everybody, when Dr. King gave his last speech, he'd been to the mountaintop speech, yeah. it was at Temple Mason, which is the world headquarters of the Church of God in Christ in yeah. Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. So I, I want to just wrap up by saying such a huge thank you, Pastor. This has been a fascinating conversation. I, uh, I think we've all really, really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you so much for, for, uh, for, for taking us down this really interesting path. Uh, I do want to turn it over now to the rabbi because, you know, it's, I mean, he's the rabbi. And that's right. Besides which, we got Purim coming up, and he, he nobody, <laughs> can, nobody can sell it like Rabbi Kahan. Uh, thank you so much. That's a yeah, a big big thank you to our to our dear friend to uh, brother Pastor Mount Hennessy. Um, so fascinating. It's it's really wonderful to share these these times and these experiences with you and the ways that we we look at our texts and and understand them in so many different contexts. Um, there's much that we share, and there's so much to learn from each other. I'm really looking forward to seeing this, uh, uh, the PBS special with uh, Henry Louis Gates on the Black Church. Um, that uh, sounded like it was really fascinating. For all of our friends that are on, um, just do want to tell you about a couple of coming events. This Friday night, we are um, honoring uh, Jewish Disabilities Awareness Month, and we have a very special guest. Um, this is a dear friend of Cantor Kahana's um, they went to school together many, many years ago. Anita Hollander is her name. She's an actress, singer. Um, uh, she's been in uh, um, a number of television productions and other things. I think we're going to share a little bit of it. Oh, not, no, that's okay. We'll do that in a second. And um, she uh, is someone who lost her leg to cancer in her 20s and has a sort of def uh, uh, created uh, shows and uh, and music uh, around the idea of what does it mean to be uh, to live to to be a disabled person in an ableist world and in the Jewish community. Uh, and I think this is going to be really really meaningful and beautiful. So uh, please join us for services Friday night six o'clock. The information and links are on our website. You can connect by Zoom. Um, for our broadcast or YouTube, Facebook Live. Um, on, the, uh, on February 25th, um, now we can see, do a little screen share. Um, we can see Ron in a completely different context as a biblical character of uh, uh, Teresh, um, along with uh, Big Than, uh, in our enchanted uh, Purim uh, spiel. Um, we've, as, as Pastor talked about, all the different ways we had to do things differently this year. Um, those of you who have joined us for our live forum spiels over the years know that we have a group of uh, uh, singers and actors who create on the Bima this uh, a wonderful retelling of the Purim spiel. This year we did it all on Zoom uh, and it's all done as essentially a movie. So um, this will be a really wonderful experience, but we will have a service beforehand at six o'clock where we will hear the Megillah being read. We'll be able to be together on Zoom and make a lot of noise. We encourage you to wear costumes. We're going to spotlight the people who are in costumes. We're going to encourage you to make noise when Haman's name is called out. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll be able to watch together this, uh, this, this poor spiel. Uh, and see not only Ron make a fool of himself, but um, your clergy make fools of themselves as well. Uh, and and uh, many other people it will be really a, a, a great and beautiful experience. And uh, uh, want to also mention that Passover is coming up. And uh, the, we have a very, very full schedule of Passover events. Every night of Passover, we'll be doing something or some during the day. Um, the calendar is very, uh, very full, very engaging. We have lots of opportunities to 
bake together. Uh, actually, I didn't mention that for Purim. Cantor is going to be leading a Humantaschen baking uh, session. Um, so that information is also on our on our website. We will have a community seder. We have a women's seder for Passover. Very, very full. Um, lots of ways to to connect. Um, Bill, want to tell us anything on adult ed on the schedule or? Uh, 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 yes, and thank you, uh, Tracy. Uh, thank you always to Tracy. Uh, but all of the events are on the, the, the website. Uh, Temple's website is uh, listed in the chat. And Bill, any, uh, any upcoming adult ed events that we want to highlight right now? Uh, programs in preparation, nothing on the calendar right now. But, okay, we, but will be soon. So uh, do check uh, for Temple members, please check beneath our dome. If you don't get our weekly email, um, do uh, uh, you can check the Temple's website or ask to receive those, those, uh, uh, those emails so you can be aware of what's going on. Any other announcements that need to be shared? Bill or Ron? Then I'll say one more uh, thank you to our guest, Pastor uh, Matt Hennessy, Reverend Doctor. Um, really, really wonderful to be with you, sir. And, uh, and to have everybody all together, thank you so much. And um, uh, I assume that everybody uh, that is on this call has power again. Uh, or is at the end of your battery, but um, uh, stay safe, stay warm, um, be grateful for all that we have, and, um, and we look forward to being together again soon. Thank you so much. It was great being here, um, Rabbi, and Elder says hello to you and uh, Cantor Khan as well. And thank you, Ron, for the invitation. You're very, very welcome. You bet. Thank you.